All right, it is October 25th. This month is getting away from us fast. Things are, the, the calendar's racing ahead. This year is almost over. And um, fall is definitely falling. <coughs> and we're getting enough of a warning that Winter's on its way. I wish it was otherwise, but it is what it is. And uh, I love the four seasons, but I'm still not used to this because I, I grew up in Southern California where it was just sunny and warm almost every day of the year. But <clears throat> we are going to depart for this session from our series on It's Time to Pray, because next weekend, there is a day of the year called Halloween, and we are going to address that, and I titled our lesson, God's Take, so that we can get a better feel for what is God's take on Halloween. So, without further ado, rule number one. Typically, when there is some sort of structure of an organization or a family or some kind of pattern that a group is going to follow, rule number one is usually the most important rule. Rule number one. Right. And on the, in the title, in the heading, I put one in all caps. And that's not an accident. I did that on purpose. Okay, so there's a, there's a blip happening. I'm not sure. Is that the sound system? Or is that the tape that you have running, babe? The video? There's a blip that's happened a couple times. I'm not sure. <laughs> It might be from Pastor's phone, because he blew his to the audio. I thought it was you. <laughs> well, that's why I'm bringing it up. I want people to know that that wasn't me. <laughs> so, rule number one. After God delivered his people from the bondage of slavery in Egypt, he demonstrated his commitment to them with numerous examples of his miraculous faithfulness. First, he caused the Egyptian army to perish before their eyes by drowning them in the very Red Sea that the Israelites had just miraculously crossed on dry land. Let me pause for a moment. If if there is a victim of a violent crime, that person is prone to have flashbacks and nightmares and fears related to the possibility that that offender, that perpetrator, could in some way get to them again. So if what they've done requires a judgment such that they are now criminally punished, it really helps the victim to have peace of mind when that individual is receives the gavel of the judge and they've got X amount of time in prison or life in prison or things like that. Because then they don't have to, you know, wake up at night thinking that they're going to come after them again. <clears throat> God, in essence, did that for his people. Because the bodies of their oppressors washed up on the shore of the Red Sea. They saw the dead carcasses <clears throat> of the Egyptian army that had been chasing them down. So 
they didn't have nightmares about the bondage. They had nice dreams about the dead bodies of the oppressors. They didn't have to worry about them that they're going to come back after. So in essence, God really did his people a favor. So they didn't have to be looking over their shoulder all the time. Continuing on your page. He then refreshed them <clears throat> with bitter waters made sweet at Mara. He provided quails and then manna for daily food. He produced fresh water from a rock. Gave them military victory over the Amalekites as Joshua led the men in battle while Moses held up his arms. And he brought Moses face to face again with his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, who came to recognize that, and this is a quote out of Jethro's mouth, the Lord is greater than all God. That's from Exodus 18, verse 11. So that's just a quick synopsis of all the things that God did to demonstrate to his people that you're my people and I'm your God. And we stick together on this. We're going to do great things. And he didn't just say it. He proved it over and over and over and over. Continue on your page. Then God... <clears throat> called Moses up to Mount Sinai where he gave Moses what have come to be called the Ten Commandments. We're looking at the 20th chapter of Exodus. The first six verses. Exodus 20 verse 1 And God spake all these words saying Now this is just God and Moses. I and the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, thou shalt have no other gods before me. No other gods. Three words. Can you say those three words with me? No other gods. Let's say it again. No other gods. This is rule one. Now he, he elaborates. Verse four. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know where all this <clears throat> is coming from. but Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, like birds or anything, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. See, they used to make images of things that they would call the water god or the whatever. Fill in the blank. They had all kind of gods. Verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. When he's saying jealous, he's saying, look, if you cross me, I will hurt you. And I won't just hurt you, but I'll hurt the people that come after you up to four generations beyond me. Because <clears throat> I have the power and authority to do it. I'm giving you a heads up. I'm giving you a warning. This is what I'm asking you to do. And if you do it, we're good. In fact, we're real good. And I've proven how good I can be to you. But if you decide you're going to serve other gods, I will hurt you and the people that come after you. What's it going to be? That's what he's basically saying. He's, he's already proven himself over and over and over and over and over and over and over. He's left no doubt that he can and will provide for them, protect them, deliver them, reward them, bless them, cover them, etc., etc., etc. And he's saying, look, I'm doing that. No other gods did that. There aren't any other gods. All the other gods are things that people make up. 
But you didn't make up walking across the Red Sea on dry land while you watched walls of water on both sides stand up in attention while I let you pass. And then you watch those waters crash down on the very people that were trying to enslave you and capture you again. So he left no doubt who was God with a capital G. And he's saying, look, don't be making up other gods. No other gods. And if you mess with this, I will hurt you. You can't make it any more clear. Verse number six. Not only, though, is he going to visit iniquity against those who hate him, but in verse six, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So rule number one takes up five verses from verses two through six. It takes five verses to give rule number one because he's very clear. He's not saying it in a way that leaves him going like, okay, wait, what did he really mean? He couldn't make it any plainer. Okay, no doubt. No other gods, period. End of conversation. And if you mess with me, I'll hurt you. Okay. Anybody that's got half a brain is going to be like a click in your heels and a salute. Yes, sir. And then you stick with that. So on your page. God makes it crystal clear that rule number one is thou shalt have no other gods beside the Lord God who just did all these things for you. All of the other commandments and laws that flow, excuse me, all of the other commandments and laws flow from the fact that the Lord God is it. He is the man. We are to acknowledge no other gods, period, without exception, in any way, shape, or form. How many would agree that based on the scriptures we've just looked at, and no doubt you have read them in the past and heard them read and discussed and maybe even taught them yourself, how many would agree that God did not leave any wiggle room? If you agree with that, raise your hand. Yeah, he didn't leave any wiggle room. Anybody that doesn't understand that, it just doesn't understand anything. All right. The next section I titled, Get Your Gods Out of My Face. Notice it's a little g, and I put it in, in quotes because really there are no other gods that actually exist. They're all made up. It's things that we assign, that we put in God's place where they don't belong. Judges chapter six, verse, the first six verses. And the children of Israel did evil, uh-oh, did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. So they, they couldn't live in their cities and towns. They had to kind of hide out in inconvenient, obscure places that weren't any fun to be in. Verse 3, and so it was, when Israel had sown, that means planted, their crops, that the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites, and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth, that's the crops, till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. For they came up with their cattle in their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, both they for both they and their camels were without number, 
and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel, verse 6, was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. So this is a pattern that we often see repeated over and over. As verse 1 says, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. In other words, they broke rule number one. And God says, like, what part of what I explained did you not understand? So it must be that you just want the punishment. Okay, you got it. So they're being oppressed now by the Midianites. And the oppression now results in the children of Israel having great distress. Their very health and life was threatened because if you can't eat, you can't stay alive. So the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Now they're discovering God again. They forgot him for a while when things were going good and they just started making other things gods. So on your page, after the death of Moses and later Joshua, the Israelites had drifted into idolatry and God permitted them to be subject to the Midianites. And I put in parentheses, ironically, it's the very people of whom Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, had been a priest. Remember what Jethro had said back after they first came out of Egypt? <clears throat> he had said, the Lord God is God. He's greater than all gods. Mm -hmm. Now, he was one of the priests of Midian, but the Midianite people in general, they didn't know about all this. So they continued their ways. But Israel chose to start serving some of their gods and other gods. Continuing in Judges 6, picking up in verse number 7. So they cried unto the Lord, verse 7, And it came to pass, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet under the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, and brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and drave them out from before you, and gave you their land. And I said unto you, verse 10, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. So despite all the proofs that God had given them, that he was God and he was with them, they still disobeyed and began to serve other gods. Now, one might be tempted to point a finger and say, dude, what were you thinking? What's wrong with y'all? You ain't got no sense. He told you. He showed you. He explained it to you. And you still. But be careful. Because as the old saying goes, for every finger you're pointing forward, there's three pointing back. So as much as we might look at this and just shake our heads and wonder why in the world would they do this? The longer you live, the more it is likely that at some point in your life you sat down, you may have even looked in the mirror and said, dude, what were you thinking? talking to the person staring back at you, which is you. We've all stepped back and thought, 
what was I thinking? So we can't we can't get too too bad down on them because in essence you're talking about yourself because we've all been there. But the bottom line is they blew it. So the prophet is saying, look, God gave you this land, but then you chose to serve the gods of the people that you defeated with the help of the Lord God. What sense does that make? None. Ever done anything that didn't make any sense? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Either that or we all have to raise our hands. Make both hands and both feet. All right, verse number 11. And, and I'll actually back on the page, I just, uh, for, for Judges 6, 7 through 10, God makes it clear why he has allowed his people to be oppressed. It's because they broke rule number one. That's why they're oppressed. They broke rule number one, which is, I am the Lord your God. No other gods before me. No other gods. Period. All right. Picking up in verse number 11. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak tree, which is in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash, the Abizrite, and his son, Gideon. Everybody say Gideon. Gideon. Gideon is famous in the Bible. Here's where he is introduced. Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. Why is he hiding it? Because of what we read a minute ago. The Midianites would come along and steal and trash and destroy their stuff. So he is on the sly trying to feed his family without his stuff getting trash. Verse number 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Now the irony here is that Gideon is basically sneaking around so he can thresh the wheat in a way that the Midianites won't catch, his, catch him and catch his stuff and destroy it. And yet God calls to him and gets his attention and calls him a mighty man of valor. At this moment, Gideon is behaving like anything but a mighty man of valor. Isn't this the mercy of God? Because he sees what you can be and become. He sees what he put in you that you're not exercising. He sees the nobility that he has placed in you, that he's calling you to, before we even know it's there. Because Gideon is basically behaving like somebody who is a frightened child. He's sneaking around because he don't want his stuff to be captured. And God calls him a mighty man of valor. Verse number 14. And the Lord looked upon him, still to Gideon, and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? All of a sudden, God is putting courage into this scared man. First, he calls him a mighty man of valor, and then he reassures him with his command and the promise. It's not you alone. It's us. It's us. I'm with thee. So on your page, God calls Gideon to lead his people out of bondage. Skipping down to verse number 22. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face, he's scared because he thinks he might die just having seen an angel. This, this is a real deal. Verse 23, And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, Thou shalt not die. Verse, 
Number 24. Then Gideon built an altar there under the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom, the God of my peace. Unto this day it is yet in Ophrah of the Abizrites. Verse 25. Now pay attention. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. Verse 25 again. He tells him, he, God tells Gideon, take the young bullock, throw down the altar of Baal that thy father had. Who is Baal? Baal is the chief god of the Mennonites. He's a false god. But the Midianites worship Baal. And here we learn that Gideon's dad did likewise. He had an altar to Baal right there on the property. And the grove, cut down the grove that is by it. The Amplified says, and cut down the Asherah, the symbol of the goddess Asherah that is beside it. So these were twin gods of the pagans, Baal and Asherah. So suddenly this really helps us understand the mess that Israel was in. They're being oppressed by the Midianites, but in large part they're being oppressed because they had adopted the faith elements of the Midianites and mixed it in with the God of Israel. In other words, they broke rule number one. Verse number 26, he tells him, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock. So get rid of this garbage to Baal and in its place put an altar unto thy God in the ordered place and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. So in other words, transform this garbage that's dedicated to a false god and rededicate it to me. That's why Tyler, get your gods out of my face. God is saying, Gideon, I'm going to use you. I'm going to deliver your people and I'm going to use you to help overthrow this bondage. But first, we got to change some elements about what's between your ears, how you're thinking, how you're doing life. You can't keep worshiping these false gods. I'm the one true God. So let's get rid of this garbage and let's set this up right. So on the page, before God could carry out his plan to deliver his people through Gideon, he first instructed Gideon to throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath and cut down the grove that is by it. The altar of Baal and the grove were specific ways, very specific ways in which God's people had put other gods before the Lord God. And then I asked all of us this question, what are our altars of Baal? What represents the groves of our life? For Christians in America, one of our altars of Baal is Halloween. That is one of our altars of Baal. Not, it's not the only one, but it's a biggie. And it's something that we have found it in many cases easy to excuse and to just kind of, you know, let it slide through there and because after all, you know, you don't want to stand out and be odd. You want your kids to enjoy everything and 
You know, you don't want to be sticking out like a sore thumb and looking so ridiculous. And after all, it's just a, you know, it's just for fun. Come on. Not as far as God's concerned. I'm going to end by sharing an article titled Halloween from a Christian Perspective. And I've put the link on the page to the website. And this, in many ways, sums it all up. Again, it's titled Halloween from a Christian Perspective. From a Christian Perspective. Halloween is a holiday, let's put it in quotes, holiday, celebrated by many Christians. The events of Halloween begin as day turns to night and the spirit of darkness descends. It is a time in which groups of children, teenagers, and adults dress in costumes and run from door to door shouting, trick or treat. Although some dress in costumes with a friendly appearance, the event is designed to convey the horror effect. Therefore, people disguise themselves as witches, goblins, skeletons, and even the devil himself. Some gather at parties and play pranks and games like bobbing for apples, while some attend haunted houses. Many often chalk this up as a time to have harmless fun. Harmless fun. But what is the true meaning of Halloween? And is there any reason for Christians to celebrate it? The origin. The origin of Halloween traces back to the ancient religion of the Celtics in Ireland thousands of years ago. The spiritual world was very important to the Celtics, so much so, so, much so that they had approximately 300 idol gods that they worshipped for various reasons. The Celtics would have a feast called Samhain, it's S-A-M-H-A-I-N, but it's pronounced Sawween, S-A-H-W-E-E-N, Sawween, on November 1st, in honor of, quote, Lord of the Dead, end quote. So this is a feast that the Celtic celebrated. They viewed the times of the year in two halves, light for summer and dark for winter. This event was held to mark the end of the light summer months and the beginning of the dark days of winter. They believed this was a time when a barrier between natural and supernatural forces was temporarily removed and ghosts and spirits could wander freely among humans. They believed these spirits would sometimes bring violence. The Celtic priests called Druids would carry out sacrificial rituals in order to pacify the Lord of the dead. These sacrifices would involve burning crops, animals, and even humans in a bonfire. The term bonfire, B-O-N-F-I-R-E, is derived from bone fire, literally meaning fires with bones of humans and animals. The practice of burning humans ended in the 1600s, and the people began burning an effigy instead to represent a human. They believed their bonfires would make the Lord of the Dead protect them from the evil spirits and ensure the sun would return after the long cold winter. The Roman Empire took over the land of the Celtics in Ireland in approximately 43 AD. As a result of this, Roman festivals began to merge with Celtic practices. One of the Roman celebrations was called Feralia, a holiday designed to give rest and peace to the departed. Sacrifices and prayers were offered on behalf of the deceased during this event. Another Roman holiday was observed in honor of Pomona, the Roman goddess of fruits and trees. Pomona's symbol of the apple was brought into the Celtic Samhain festival and thus the Halloween tradition of bobbing for apples was born. As the Roman Empire expanded, so did Christianity. 
which had reached the Celtic territory by the seventh century. At this time, Pope Boniface IV introduced All Saints Day, all in caps, All Saints Day, to honor saints and martyrs. It was created with hopes of replacing the pagan festival of the dead. It was originally observed on May 13th, but since the church could not stop the pagan worship, they thought merging with the pagan holiday would suppress it. Therefore, in 834, Pope Gregory III changed the All Saints Day celebration from May 13th to November 1st. It was a time for Christians to remember the saints and loved ones who had passed on. The definition of hallowed, H-A-L-L-O-W-E-D, like we say, our Father, jar in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The definition of hallowed is sacred or holy. And since this was a holy celebration, October 31st became known as All Hallows Eve. You catching on here? Is it starting to make sense? All Hallows Eve, the day before. Even though this celebration was intended to replace Sawin, the Sawin pagan festival, many of their customs survived. And when merged with All Hallows Eve, Halloween was born. Looking at Halloween today, we find that none of the Christian rituals survived except for the hallow in Halloween. This is what happens when we bring worldly practices into the church and attempts to Christianize unbelievers. The intent may be good, but usually ends in bad results. The next topic, Halloween in America. The celebration of Halloween found its way to America in the 1800s, when millions of Irish immigrants came searching for relief from a famine and brought their customs with them. In their native land, the Irish would carve out turnips or beets as lanterns to represent the dead. Due to a shortage of turnips and beets in America, the immigrants turned to the abundant pumpkin crop to make their lanterns. Pumpkins were carved with demonic faces and a light placed inside to scare off what they believed were wandering spirits of the dead. The following symbols of Halloween were incorporated in various ways to communicate with the dead. I repeat, to communicate with the dead. That's demonic right there. Here's some of the symbols. Bats, owls, witches, black cats, etc. When it comes to witches, I am reminded of what the Apostle Paul said about witchcraft. He stated that all who practice this sin will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's Galatians chapter 5. Do you get that? All who practice the sin of witchcraft, and we make jokes out of witches. We make it a joke. Is it really worth your soul? Next topic, trick or treat. As stated earlier, trick or treat is the signature line given by Halloween revelers as they run from house to house. This ritual also traces back to the pagan Samhain festival of the Celtics. The Celtics believed spirits of the dead would rise out of the grave and wander the earth during Samhain. They believed some of the dead would return to their old residences. So they would place plates of food at their doorways along with gifts, hoping they would soothe the wandering spirits. They feared the ghosts would harm their livestock or property if not pacified with a tree. Another way the villagers believed they could protect themselves from the dead was through trickery. Some would wear masks while others put soot on their faces hoping the ghosts would view them as just another spirit of the dead rather than a human. They thought that this trickery would cause the evil spirits to pass them by. This began the present day Halloween practice of disguising oneself as a demonic creature. The villagers looked 
to find protection either by tricking or treating the spirits of the dead. Next topic, church fall festivals. Many churches have fall festivals on the same evening as Halloween so that Christian kids will have something to do rather than trick-or-treating and all the other evil activities that come along with Halloween. This was designed to prevent kids from celebrating Halloween. I understand the concept, but remember that Christians had the same idea over a thousand years ago when they created All Saints Day to replace the pagan Sawween festival. Their intent was good, but it evolved into Christians accepting pagan practices. I see history repeating itself today because all Christian kids are not being taught why we should not celebrate Halloween. This has led to kids attending church festivals in Halloween costumes. Therefore, I think it is best that Christians conduct themselves on Halloween the same as any other ordinary day. I know that some think this makes it too tough on the kids, but if we teach our children at an early age why this is no special day, I do not think they will feel left out on Halloween. I am not saying that church fall festivals are wrong, but it can be very misleading to vulnerable kids and sometimes adults when not properly handled. So why run the risk? We all know the saying, when you play with fire, expect to eventually get burned. Conclusion. In the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15, we find the text, quote, Catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes, end quote. When the small foxes go looking for grapes, they are often out of their reach. In order to get to the crop, the fox will chew the entire vine. This would not only mean losing some of his current crop, but the farmer will lose the entire vine, which is more devastating. The same thing can happen to us spiritually. When we allow what some view as little harmless foxes to become a part of our lives, they can chew on us until we are completely destroyed. That's what can happen by compromising and celebrating Halloween. Satan has always tried to trick man into following him by, to, by portraying something as small and innocent. He does this by getting people to compromise on small things, and before you realize it, he has infiltrated your spirit with many demonic forces. Christians are to, quote, test all things, hold fast what is good. That means hold tight what is good, abstain from every form of evil. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21 and 22. Let me read that again. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Without a doubt, participating in Halloween is not abstaining from evil because Halloween derived from pagan worship of evil things. Even though the Celtics intended to keep evil spirits away, they ended up glorifying them through idol worship. Protection from evil can only be found in the one and only true God. If you still have doubts on what Christians should do concerning Halloween, study the scripture, quote, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them, end quote. That's Ephesians 5.11. If Halloween is innocent fun, why do numerous cults gather on that night to worship Satan? If Halloween is only innocent fun, why are parents warned to watch out for people doing evil deeds on this day? For instance, candy tainted with poison and razor blades. Does this sound like fun? It is not fun because it is all a satanic deception. When Christians compromise, we send the message to children that this is okay. By doing this, we are opening the door for demonic influence. Do not allow our children to celebrate something that once allowed burning people to death in idol worship. A child may not seem affected by Halloween initially, but it can lead to evil things later in life, like bad behavior, obsession with violence and evil things like monsters, 
creatures of darkness, witchcraft, satanic worship, fixation on death and killing, for instance, the Columbine shootings. In closing, we must stand firm as Christians and not compromise with the world and with Satan's practices. Without a doubt, Halloween has no place in Christianity. And these are some related scriptures. Romans 12 and 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 and 15. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. When you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. And finally, 1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from every form of evil. I think this gives us a pretty good introductory look at Halloween from God's take. Do I want to think like God and please him? Or am I more interested in fitting in with the world? I don't think the options could be any cleaner. I hope I haven't ruined your day or your week, but I hope I have enlightened us yeah. to realize what's really going on. Don't be deceived. God bless you.